Black revolutionaries, distillery owners, Italian fashion retailers, and Motown Grammy winners all share their best stories never before told in any other media outlets on Detroit is Different. Visit DetroitIsDifferent.com or download the Detroit is Different app on Apple's App Store or Google's Play Store. Let's see. Okay. Welcome back to the Detroit is Different Studios. And we being colorful right now. We're getting <laughs> colors. We're uh we're brightening up because spring is rolling in. And as spring rolls in, y'all already know what that means for Detroit. We getting out, we getting about. Everybody that bought a motorcycle this past winter is gonna be driving it even though it's 50 degrees. We know you out there. You, you couldn't wait. You couldn't wait. The bicycle people, the slingshot people, the I got my new barbecue pit people, but more so. It's the business people, the creativity people that we connect with here at Detroit is different. Regina Ann Campbell, how are you today? I'm doing great. So excited to be with you today, Kari. Uh, just, it, it's just a joy. I've been watching Ooh. what you're doing. And, you know, I love Detroit and Detroit is different. <laughs> and I'm happy to it be sure here. It sure is. It sure is. So we had a rich, fruitful before recording conversation. So I rarely get into those. But it was just, it just started running, just connecting and so many things. So I'm going to play a little bit like I don't know because I'm just going to find it out just like a couple minutes ago. So we're going to start this out how we always started out. Your Detroit story, your people. How did your people end up in Detroit City proper? Okay, well, uh, my grandmama. Uh, on my dad's side is okay. from Little Rock, uh, Arkansas. Wow. And my grandfather, my dad's daddy, uh, is from um, actually somewhere in Louisiana. It's a small town. They met. Uh, and it was at a time when things were really, really uh, challenging for my grandma and uh, hmm. and my grandfather. And it was like, we're going to go north. And uh, my grandfather asked my grandmother to marry him. And he said, she said, if you let me bring my younger sisters with me. Hmm. Uh, and they came up to Detroit. Uh, okay, so one second. Dad, I got to wait. I got to. We we gotta unpack that a little bit, boy. That was some back in the day. That's some back in the day old school marriage. It's like <laughs> if, if my sisters come too, and it's like it's like that means your grandma was fine, and he was really into her. He was like, mm, I know we gonna have kids too, but come on, yeah. bring them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's um, how my granddad was, and um, he passed away before I was born. Mm. But my dad and his siblings. They get emotional when they talk about mm. him. He was like six foot six uh, and just an amazing person. And so they came on to Detroit. So my dad is the first, his first generation of Detroit race and has always loved Detroit and mm -hmm. instilled that in us. Um, my mom, who my dad married, was already in Detroit. Uh, mm. And her people had been here. Her mom and them had actually been here from uh, Alabama. So, so. So you mentioned uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, and I got family down that way, too. Uh, my dad, um, my, my paternal side. So, like, my dad, uh, his mom, and his mom, a as we think about, like, so much in this story of, mm -hmm. of America goes. Like, my grandmother had the option of mm -hmm. um, being a part of that group to desegregate the school. Oh, she wow. was like, nah, I'm going to stay over here because I want it <laughs> safe. So, um Little Rock, Arkansas. You've been down there. You, have you seen the culture cause, and the feel and, and that connection? So I went down there. It's probably been seven, eight, nine years ago. I went and saw Little Rock, Arkansas, including the church uh, that my grandmother went to and drove around, hmm. saw that red dirt. Um, I think what I found most interesting uh, in the area was uh, you could see the old prisons. Um, that they still have a lot of them there um, and very small. And so it just made me think of them being in inhumane conditions, um, which was really, really sad. But the vibrancy there um, is my understanding that um, we actually had some land there. Hmm. And then the family that was there, they sold it. And there's a mall on it now. And so okay. we're like, oh, you know. So you was walking so in Macy's like, this is my family. <laughs> This is my family. <laughs> so all those good things. And I will say for me, unfortunately, my dad had some experiences in college when he uh, was at a year in TSU, uh, as well as some other experiences. Um, he said when he was in the Air Force, he actually got beat by the police. And mm. so 
um, they didn't take us down south. Um, mm-hmm. And I envy those of my friends and colleagues who, associates who say, yeah, every summer, even though they didn't like it. Mm-hmm. And my husband was one of those who, every summer they'd go down there and be with the family. Mm-hmm. I envy that. Um, because it's, it's something about that legacy that um, really helps you clearly know who you are, right? And mm-hmm. many of us, uh, we our roots are in the South. And so I know mm-hmm. I was really grateful for the opportunity to live in Memphis those three years and be around that legacy and understand how valuable that is to see generation of generation of, you know, um, people and organizations. I'm a Delta uh, and um, the first in my family um, and um, the first one to graduate, you might say college, as far as one of the kids in the family. My mother, she graduated from college with five kids and a husband. Mm. Uh, she... Um, Got her associate's degree first from Wayne County Community College, and I started at Wayne County mm-hmm. Community College. Uh, and she went on to get her bachelor's from Wayne State University and then her master's in library science. Um, all of the time when she was working a job, right, she you, was taking you, a bus, one second, you, cooking. You, you, you jumped the gun to, to, to parents already. <laughs> yeah. And I definitely want to yeah. explore this because your mother was a librarian. Yes. So I, I definitely want to unpack that as it's a lot yes. of library topics, not just in Detroit, across the nation right yes. now. Um, libraries took a big hit after COVID, uh-huh. uh, one of the biggest hits. And and I'm friends, or Detroit is different for me and others. We're friends with the Detroit Public Library. Mm-hmm. Um, so before we get there, you said Alabama too. So Alabama, Arkansas, a lot of the great migration routes usually uh, follow the train, the railroad line. So a lot of the... A lot of people from the Arkansas and Texas, Louisiana, usually end up in Milwaukee, Chicago, like Western patterns. Mm -hmm. Alabama, that's why I have so many black folks from Alabama, Georgia, you know, a couple from Florida. Some of them Floridians went, you know, went to New York and all that uh, out east a little bit further. But it's unique that the Arkansas, like... That I, I wanted to ask, do you have you know, what was it that drew them this way? And do you have a lot of family on that side further west, like in the St. Louis, Chicago, Milwaukee, the, out that way? Well, the interesting thing is um, some of the family from Arkansas are over in um, Massachusetts, what's called Springfield, Massachusetts, mm-hmm. about 30 or so minutes from Boston. Mm-hmm. Um, but most of them either came this way toward Michigan hmm. Uh, and uh, like I said, over near Boston uh, in Massachusetts, which is so interesting. Um, and I think about my great grandmother, um, who was um, Blackfoot Indian. Um, she at that time was in um, Springfield, Massachusetts, when my grandfather on my maternal side found her and married her, you know. Hmm. Um, and so I, you know, I always like to think about my dad loved Detroit so much, he still does about them coming to Detroit, planted that seed, um, that um, there's nothing that you can ever say about Detroit that my dad would, would, would probably like not go off on people about. Mm. Um, and, and, it, and obviously it's something that um, was planted in me because literally my dad tells me the story of how one, he, he named me um, Regina Ann, uh, and Ann was popular back then because I got a cousin named Yolanda Ann. There's a lot of people around. Mm-hmm. Sort of when I was born, Ann was popular. But Regina means queen. And I was like, he must have predicted I was going to be the only woman in my house <laughs> um, among my three T's, as I call them. And he actually went into the service on 316, which is my birthday before I was born. Mm. And it's something about all those things. I was like, that's why Regina's so Detroit, you know. Mm. It's like um, my older sister was born in Springfield, Massachusetts. Mm. And I was born in Detroit, the first mm. one of the kids born that's in deep. Detroit. So, So your family did stay that way at one point but when my dad was in the service we we were that way um and and and, um i do have this question now so neighborhood because mm -hmm. that's always usually the next thing what neighborhoods do you did did your family settle in throughout detroit Mm -hmm. um what drew them to those neighborhoods you know when about so we stayed in a variety of places in detroit um 
the one most vividly um, first was we stayed on Heckler Street, which is almost near like Vinewood, because it was this big old house, and we were these little girls. It was me and my uh, two sisters at that time, and we would change our room to a different room, it seemed like, every week. Uh, we also stayed what's considered um, the other side of Mexican um Mexican town, um, like Chicago, not Chicago, but 35th Street, uh, mm. Campbell and Buchanan, the other side of Michigan Avenue, mm. um, where we went to St. Francis and um, we were one of two black families at that time in the community. We were in a Polish community. And then uh, after eighth grade, my folks moved to the west side of Detroit near mm. Cooley High School. So uh, my high school years, I basically grew up on um, the west side Uh mm near Cooley High School, and I worked some jobs over there on that corridor where it used to be uh, Mammoth and King's Way, and uh, I worked at Little stuff. Caesars, and it was a retail shop I worked mm-hmm. at, and um, record hey, shop devil. I used to, we used to go to uh, to get our 45s and our vinyl, yeah. so yeah. Yeah, you had Red Devil over there. I had a oh, aunt yeah. that uh, grew up, uh, well, you know, right. she was over on Marlowe, like right down the street. We stayed on Marlowe, <laughs> then went to Cooley. <laughs> So let me make this clear to you, Kyrie. So mm-hmm. this is the thing. I always say this, and some people might be like, ah. So when I graduated from um, eighth grade, you know, I've been in a private school. I wanted to go to Head- St. Hedwig or Holy Redeemer. And my folks were like, no, you're going to go to Cooley. They wanted me to test for Chasm Renaissance. Hmm. They gave me the choice. And I was like, Mm-mm, I ain't busting in neither one of them. My school, the choice, if I'm going to have to bust to a school, it'll be, you know, Holy Redeemer, St. Hedwig. So I chose Cooley. Wow. Two and a half blocks down, straight down the path. And I'll also say I played soccer in uh, high school as well. And I tell people at the end of the day, one, for me, education is not about this school versus that school because we all had the same things. And guess what? We end up in the same places. So it's not one better or the other. And so I say to folks who there's still certain schools open, other ones ain't. It don't mean they're better. It's what's left. You know what I'm saying? And so don't tear away, don't take away from other kids that are other schools. Y'all happen to be the only ones left to compare it to. And I'm in the same rooms as many of them. So it's Mm -hmm. not this school versus that school. It's us. It's us and making sure that we all get our kids educated to where they're at their highest and their best. Yeah, I, I was I was just jokingly saying it's some calf technician. Like, no, it's not <laughs> right now. I know, but the reality is, are you the best if you're the only ones left? Who are you comparing it to? I mean, seriously. I mean, you know what I'm saying. And mm-hmm. and, and 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 many brilliant people in the community, right? If you're looking at data, what are you comparing it to? Based on what? Because you're the only ones there. You know what I'm saying. So I I just think there's different ways to evaluate what and why. And uh, there was a time when I was in school, we had the same thing that every other school had, period. Uh, And we've got to really, really get back to that for all of our children. Um, They want to learn. They crave and learn. And many of them are smarter than us. And we've got to do better to provide them an environment where they can grow mentally, socially, emotionally, uh, and just thrive. Because they're brilliant. They want to learn. It ain't that they don't want to learn. I don't care what people say. Is not an environment of safety, an environment where they're learning at different levels with technology integrations and things, and we need to do more. So I just tell people all the time, get off of smart. I'm smart. I'm this. I'm smart. We all smart. We all got certain gifts and strengths. It doesn't mean that one is better than the other. It just means that we're in this world, and we should be driving toward what we're great at, Um, not always emphasizing our weaknesses. You got other people who compliment you, like on my team. I can I don't do everything, but I know what I'm good at and great at. I got other people working with me who have strengths that I don't have. And, and I was gonna say, like Cooley, um, from knowing it in neighborhoods, got well, kind of like two parts. So I started at King, ended at Northwestern. So seeing kind of some of the difference, I, I think that usually I, I recently had another interview where we were speaking about the role of parents. Mm-hmm. One of the key differences, I think, in a quote unquote good school is usually you have more parent involvement in a lot of those schools. But furthermore, um, my high school year, I m- my senior year, I was doing uh, I was one of the last students that had a radio show on 90.9, the D- DPS network so we did a sports show so I went to I want to say like at that time there were 35 high schools in Detroit so that's like 2000 I 
stepped foot and went to like a football game or a basketball game for maybe about 28 of them. Mm -hmm. Cooley had like a unique culture to it. Uh, the design, the neighborhood itself. Oh, yeah. um, and I'm talking about just the, the building itself. Hence the auditorium the is one of the most historic where it was, to, you know, mm -hmm. got burnt. Including Cooley High alumni, we still get together on a regular basis across mm -hmm. schools. Yeah. Um, so, again, I don't say that to say that Cooley is the only school, but when I say no. we've got a bunch of great alumni Very much across so. the board from Very these so. schools, from my generation before and those graduating now, mm -hmm. um, and everybody, they all need to be lifted up because to graduate in these days and times uh, is a huge, huge big deal. And one other thing I wanted to mention, too, um, about the time when I grew up, um, even my youngest brother is so funny. He didn't realize he was in the first uh, graduating class for Crockett, first football team, first mm. basketball team, okay. and so on and so forth. He didn't realize that I didn't grow up with metal detectors at my school uh, and guns and shooting. Mm -hmm. uh, we were in a conversation just the other day, and he said, really? I said, nope. When I went to high school, we didn't have guns and metal detectors. It was a very different environment. I will say cracks start coming in, uh, but back then, um, the those who were selling drugs, you know, yeah, the Young Boys Incorporated, they did what they did didn't interfere with other kids or grandma or other neighborhoods. When I say that, it wasn't bullets um, sh shooting if, shooting us or people who weren't in the game, so to speak. Um, and things changed over time. But the one thing about crack, and it, it's a very um, um, important thing that people understand of why our communities went in the ground. Crack was the only drug that succumbed black women in community. If you think about you know, heroin and other things in the history of our community, in war and all of that, it was the black mother, wife, auntie, neighbor who was able to hold the community together. But when crack came, our grandmothers, our aunties, our cousins, our women neighbors also started doing the drug. Mm -hmm. I, and I, so that anchor that was there to hold the medium together, it was no longer there. And that's when you start seeing so much more rapid um you know, sort of devastation and, um, you know, disinvestment and a variety of things happening because we were not all on drugs, the black woman. No, I, I think um, I think it's it's a lot of things, uh, sociopolitical, um, economic impacts around that time uh, that to black communities across America. Uh, when we think of that. Early early mid 80s mm -hmm. to uh, the mid 90s of things happening mm -hmm. uh, with that exasperated some of the challenges of those issues because as you speak to um, in studying history uh, a lot of this research has been done by I don't know if anybody reads Dr. Carl Hart you know he has some some good points that that I you know he's obviously a doctor and researches this stuff but some of it I can align with the stories as I gather here from a lot of my interviews with Detroit is different and I'm a natural conversationist I think through speaking so I talk to a lot of people heroin was a big um, devastated the black community uh, and throughout America almost like in in like two intervals so you have like I guess kind of during the Harlem Renaissance era where you have a lot of jazz musicians that struggle with mm -hmm. addiction but that kind of was a part of like the nightlife culture of that mm -hmm. and then also after the Vietnam War um, and then that kind of combined to these methadone clinics that mm -hmm. were prevalent throughout communities uh, and you know that at the time there were you know the same way people would be like oh you know now watching BMF and it's like oh that's smart you 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 get a job at one of these factories and then you sell drugs at the factory you know it makes sense like that was something that was going back and happening you know mm -hmm. for years uh, one of the key differences is you know during that time also you had not just people losing their jobs you had the shedding down of whole factories too so you have this influx of of uh, you, you know uh, anchor a city like Detroit, Flint, Milwaukee, Chicago, places Cleveland, Pittsburgh, places where you know Akron, Ohio, 
uh, like held by this industrial model of America. Mm -hmm. So as this industrial model of America is declining, then you have this new drug. And and like I, I, I like like the first couple seasons and I'm still going to watch this last season of Snowfall, but I believe Snowfall presented a very good um, presentation of how crack was even packaged to mm -hmm. begin with to most people because I brought this up on the show before. Um, cocaine was a glamour drug of the 70s. Right. It was seen as opulence. It was seen as you're successful. You're you have made it. You have achieved life. You could look at cocaine like it was right. champagne. There we are. So, and yeah, champagne and caviar. So now you have all of, you, you know, you have basically the 1970s as a promotional tool saying like, if you're successful, you do cocaine. You do cocaine. And now you have 80s saying like, hey, it's a way to experience this success in a will, in, in a reasonable price, at a reasonable price without having the understanding of the of the detrimental impacts it will have physically, mentally, emotionally, the type of addiction it will cause and everything like that. Hence that was crack. It'd be like right now if a, if a person said, "Hey, like as as plastic surgery is becoming so big, and sadly, I think it is kind of like that. Like if somebody said, "Hey, this is a cheap version of plastic surgery. You want it? Right. Here right. you go." You know, and most people will say, "Hmm, I try what I see one person trying it. They not messed up. Then they see another person try it." They not messed up. And then you have like the the this job industry. It just no longer exists. My my mom graduated Central High School. My dad graduated from Central High oh, School. For real? 67. And like she said, it would be brothers, you know, like some of our classmates would just get to the 10th grade and be like, yeah, I'm gonna just walk over here to Ford and just get a job. Um less prevalent in the 70s, a lot less prevalent in the 80s, and almost non-existent in the 90s. So we have the the uh, 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 culture of creating even the schools to to build these industrial workers of and course. industry no longer exists. And now you have an addiction, hence this escapism. It was a, a culmination of a lot of tragic uh, circumstances that impacted uh, the black community in volume. Um, the same way that like right now, like some of more statistics are coming out about, you know, the tragedy of the opioid epidemic, especially the heightening of so many overdoses and so many more people being uh, becoming addicted to opioids during what happened with the COVID-19 pandemic, because you, you just have like a stopping of a system and drug use is, is a form of escapism. I believe it was like a, a it was almost like a, a massive bomb at the wrong time that impacted I would say it's not a black family I know that it did not impact right right and I, and again I still uh, yes all of that a number of things mm -hmm. but crack black women cleave, and, cleave oh. to you and know what I'm saying that's the other, it. Uh, it it definitely would black, cleave, black women. women cleave yes. to this and yes even if you know even when you talk about heroin there was uh, maybe one black man, maybe auntie did it, but grandma didn't. No, and it was mama not, didn't, right? So you not, had a, no. a, a, a somebody mm -hmm. to still help hold the community together, a village, you know, raising the child, a village. Oh, and then now grandma, auntie, we all sitting up here, you know, cracked out. Uh, and who's raising the kids? And so and the drug sentencing laws mm -hmm. that came like after the really like soon after Lynn Bias's death. Um, and especially the drug sentencing laws targeting mm -hmm. younger people. So now it's like, yes, mom and grandma are struggling with addiction. Son and father are incarcerated mm -hmm. for like 25 years. The child that's there is raising themselves in certain mm -hmm. ways, you know, or the community is looking to galvanize around that. Like it was such a, it was such a, 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 a an impactful issue because of, I believe, some of another ec term I use often, ec economic term, externalities that coupled on top of the actual challenge that it caused mm -hmm. in, inside of our community. And you're right. I, as I think about the the use of so many women because it was packaged like, hey, this is like weed. You know, you can just smoke it a little bit. You know, Or their significant other was doing it. They brought mm -hmm. it to them and, you know. 
Um, so they tried it and, yeah. and, and, and got hooked. And so that was the demise to me that, when I say the demise, who was helping our communities, you know, stay together and look out for one another. Um, that's when you start seeing so much disinvestment and, uh, well, when I say not disinvestment as much as, we didn't you know, have the resources to reinvest. Resources to, yeah. We didn't. And that's why we're talking yeah. about reinvesting. Mm-hmm. I am, my background is urban planning and business. Uh, history shows that policy has uh, definitely influenced and resourced why our communities are where they are now. Mm-hmm. People say that government shouldn't help us get our neighborhoods and communities back in order. Yes, you should. Um, from the freeways to the um, the thirty year mortgage that was given to you know um, non non black veterans, it was all policy, mm-hmm. and so policy has a place in helping our urban communities across the country um, stabilize. Uh, with significant investment. And so to me, policy, and I worked for the late Miriam a half a few years ago, we have to be a part of policy change because what continues to happen day to day, and we talk about, you know, racism. Racism is, you know, it's a systematic thing. If we don't change policy, we will continue to see a number of the other cyclical things that continue to happen in in communities uh, across the country. So Um, I always say to people, you don't have to be the expert in policy, but you definitely need to know policy that impacts um, those you serve, impacts your community and neighborhood, um, and figure out how to be a part of the policy change and hold people in office accountable. Um, Because we're doing what we we can right at this level, but it's laws that govern absolutely everything. Um, Resources that are allocated to our communities, to our schools, is laws. And, and along with the laws in, in speaking in an agency, wow, we're, we're getting into a way deeper conversation sooner than I was expected, but I like it. <laughs> I like where we're at. Um, it's, it's understanding the policy, understanding the impact it could have on the community, but also not marrying yourself to a solution that has not necessarily been mm. tried, tested, and true. Have the willingness to be like, all right, we tried this. It worked to to, it worked like this, this but didn't right. expand. Um, right now, uh, our sitting president, uh, Joe Biden, and even uh, Hillary Rodham Clinton has been like appointed as like, oh, they did the crime bill. They locked up all these black men. It was a, a overwhelming support of even from a lot of people in the black community that supported the crime bill at the at the time because it was a misunderstanding of the ways it would impact our community. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, it's it's like we have to try ideas. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, if, if, if me and you were planning a dinner and it's like, hey, it's a bunch of kids. Let's get pizza. And then we get a bunch of pizzas and then a bunch of kids walk in and everybody's like, hey, half the room's lactose intolerant. That right. does not mean that we say, <laughs> all right, still eat pe- a little bit of pizza. No, that means that we, we got to go back to the drawing board, get some other right. food to respond to. I believe some of it is also the the hubris and and the ego of um leadership not having the willingness to say all right, I don't want to say my bad, but we need to pivot from this as but opposed you know to dying what? on a sword. But what you've just described it requires um patience, it yes. requires work, it requires mm-hmm. effort. And the unfortunate thing that is, is people are about mediocrity and don't want to lift anything or do the work. They just want it to happen. And it's easier for people to do what's always been done, Mm -hmm. right, than to innovate and think about what's next. This part, to your point, is working or it may not be working at all, right? Mm -hmm. And don't put your ego in a way if we have to throw it out because it ain't working, period. We got data, we got feedback that's showing it's not having the impact that you intended, but people would rather not do the work or the lift or the high touch. That's the unfortunate piece Mm -hmm. for um, more that could be done, but it also creates the opportunity for those like you and me and others out there who are willing to do that lift. Now, it's a long game. It's a long race. You know, I always think of things like it's a big elephant and I can only eat it one bite at a time. But every bite 
has some impact and a way to make a destination that's going to be sustainable. And I'm always about sustainability in everything that I do. And it take a moment to get there. Yeah. And, and even understanding, because because this is the other thing, I think, with crack sentencing that created more of a prison industrial complex that definitely has mm -hmm. been imposed in our community. <laughs> People stop. The, the crack industry began to falter like near the mid 90s to the to the late 90s and one of my favorite art forms definitely promoted it as if it was still dangerous and that's hip-hop love hip-hop but <laughs> hip-hop's view and the perspective of 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 a lot of the acts of what of the opportunities connected to to the crack industry don't align with the realities i've seen living over here on rosa parks uh growing up around linwood Davison, Dexter, like the, it just didn't align. So you still had like this infrastructure, as you say, it takes time and patience that, that built, you know, the private, the private, uh, privatized prisons. Um, it, and, you know, and then on the other side with women, it, it impacted in other ways of like, you know, uh, of, you know, when you sentence, a, a child um, and you're the mother and, and, and even the sentencing of mothers being implicated in the actions of children that in a lot of ways, you know what I'm saying? They just threw on their headphones and listening to, I don't know, Jay-Z, GZ, Master P. I, I mean, who, who ain't talking about selling crack is, is the, is the best business opportunity for black people. You know what I'm saying? What did Jay, what did um, Biggie say? You know, either slanging crack rock or you got a wicked jump shot at a time in 93 when I believe that, the the gains, the material gains of money connected to that industry were mm -hmm. not as prevalent as what I remember seeing like in the eighties, you know what I'm saying? Right. Like even like five, six years ago. Right. So right. so but you still had this infrastructure. You had prisons that were being built. You had you had states mm -hmm. paying prisons that obviously if I'm paying a prison you need people to be inside right, the prison of for it to the function. Beds, right. You, you know, <laughs> you because this was the solution, how we interpreted this crime bill, which hence pivoting from that. So it, it definitely takes courage. It takes understanding. It takes a lot of confidence to say, look, I think I was wrong here. And now we need to move in this direction as opposed to that direction. Um, and, and, and it's essential. It, it's tough because in, in the world of how messaging goes now and how people like me and marketing will take it. Yeah. The minute that Hillary Clinton comes on on TV and says, I was wrong about the crime bill. I'm so bad. Hey, I can straight up tell you every black content creator and a lot of liberal white content creators are going to hop down her throat. But it would convey a sincerity where now it's like, damn, I, I feel mm -hmm. as though she's she's connected with me in a form of honesty that I usually don't see in right. in from this position, from a person in this position, where now, you know, we can have the willingness and, as you say, the courage to try something else, and that's going to be tough. It's going to take the work. It's going to take some time. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we think of even the programs of uh, another, like, hence, like, it's so many dominoes uh, that, ha that happen. Like, even during that time, a community like mine, you still had a, a huge homeowner base that lived right. here for forever. But that right. was also during the time as many other homeowners were, were leaving. And I believe uh, my aunt, a lot of my neighbors and others were intentionally targeted with refinance mortgages where a lot of people, as they say, you know, old school term, but hawk they house. And, and that was even more so than the, the, the toughest time during the crack era. Right. Most That's of true, my definitely. neighbors left in 2007, 8, mm -hmm. 9, 10. And now it's banks or possibly the city, but usually like a lot of banks that own a lot of these properties aren't upkeeping them. I wish my neighbor could have stayed in that home, but they refinanced. But mm -hmm. the refinancing was from the fact of I need to leave this dangerous community mm -hmm. or I need to re finance to, to 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 try to solidify my home and secure it or you know help my family that's leaving their homes or whatever like it was a it was a myriad of challenges but back to like the reinvestment must come from us stepping up forward hence your story and, and your mission is key in this you know and i feel like we're talking so social let's let's get back into that story like mm -hmm. as you um and me too, like community college. So from 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 high school 
from Cooley, where does your journey take you? Um, and how did your journey get to the point where now build institute, you're, you're, you're a business leader, you're, you're assisting people bring their dreams to life mm -hmm. and bring it to life with some organization where they can't, it can be sustainable. Uh, your term <laughs> that I love too. That's, that's the right thing, you know, sustain. It can exist. It can be a part of your life. You're not choosing business or person. Mm -hmm. Um, what led you in that path? So, um, I always like to say that I was an economic developer long before I even knew what it was. Okay. Um, growing up, my mother and dad and them would always take us downtown, you know, um, you know, vibrant shopping. We would go to the Hudson's, you know, which was one mm. of the most profitable in the nation. I remember seeing, you know, we, it would be a long line to wait to see Black Santa, Kresge, that used to be down near the escalators, going and mm. getting them deli sandwiches. And then in the neighborhoods, we had a grocery store in every neighborhood, um, you know, retail. I even worked in a retail store. But I love seeing people in these businesses mm. interacting and engaging and smiling, just having a good time. Um, so I was um, drawn to community and, and co commercial corridors. And one particular time, I did work at Recorders Court. That's Frank Murphy's Call of Justice, uh, for those who don't call it Recorders Court. Okay, and let me say this. <laughs> it's still a lot of people. Uh, my big homie, rest in peace, Chokwe Lamoon, but, but a lot of people that know that was a court that still should be open. It still should be open, and, and, and it was a powerful tool for the black community. Yes, indeed. And so my dad worked for Recorders Court. He loved Nikki's Pizza, which is down there mm -hmm. in Greektown, still okay. there. And I had a little money, and so I was like, I'm going to catch the bus, the Grand River bus. I stayed on the northwest, Grand River, Greenfield area. I was like, I'm going to take the bus downtown, mm -hmm. meet my dad uh, at Recorders Court, and we're going to walk over to Nikki's. And as I stood there, I started noticing when the buses start, you know, having challenges running because the buses it was the time they ran because that's how we got to school. That's how we got downtown. That's how, you know, my mother would get to work in school. And I'm standing there on uh, um, Marlowe and, uh, you know, Grand River bus stop. And I'm like, the bus taking forever. And I'm looking around. I'm like, boarded up, built, you know, uh, stores on uh Grand River, I'm like, that's closed, that's closed. I'm like, that's closed. And in that moment, this 16-year-old felt real sad. Hmm. And I said to myself then, I said, you're going to help Detroit revitalize. I didn't know what revitalization meant then. I didn't. Mm -hmm. But spirit or something made me say that. And no matter what it took to get there and find that path, I was going to find it. And so... After high school, one of my mother was, she was uh, working on her associates at Wayne County Community College and um, uh, getting, uh, also worked as assistant librarian. And so I was very familiar with Wayne County Community College, spent a lot of time up there with her. And I didn't want to directly go into a four-year college. Um, and so I spent a lot of time on the campuses, the different campuses, having my classes at Wayne County Community College. And I was interested in occupational therapy at that time. One, um, I always thought I would be a doctor, and somebody back then told me I would never be a doctor, and somehow I embraced that in my mind. And mm. when I think about, you know, what I know now over the over years of what I know now, I can do anything. I still remember all the muscles and the bones, and I was very good at stuff like that because I'm a visual mm. and tactile learner. Um, and so I went to do OT instead to be an assistant. And I was like, oh, I'm going to spend this much time um, doing um, being an assistant. I could go on and be a registered one. So I transferred to Wayne, Western Michigan University. Hmm. Finished there. Um, graduated. Um, originally, I was going to have OT. I was, couldn't pass the test back then. I got all A's on my prereqs, physiology, micro, you name it. But they had a test back then that you had to take to get into the OT program and it was $70 a pop back then that was a lot of money mm -hmm. I paid twice and couldn't get a high enough score so mm -hmm. I said Shh, forget this I gotta get out of here mm -hmm. so I changed my minor which was psychology to my major and my minor was African American studies and I got up out of there mm -hmm. um, my first job was um, at Vista Maria mm -hmm. and I loved working with the girls I still love youth have a special place for youth in my life um, youth are only in a world that, you know, was created by adults. You know, they are, you know, we responsible for them. So the decisions they make are based on what the hands they've been dealt. Um, 
And so did that and started doing community planning, community development. I started watching all the CDCs here, um, everything from you snap back with Linda Smith, who I adore. I've been like admiring mm-hmm. all of them. And I remember Vince Murray and um, even Tom Gadaris and just CDCs because they were doing real estate development. Um, then I got to find out more about what community development meant. Hmm. Um, but after working with the girls, I realized that policy impacted me being able to serve them. So I'm like, do I go back for an MBA or do I go for an MSW in community practice social action? Mm-hmm. So I evaluated, as I did with Western, who had the best social work program at that time. And it was actually Wayne State. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I went to Wayne State, uh, got my degree in community practice social action, uh, worked for the late Miriam Mahaffey, worked for United Way doing some community planning. And I came across what was called housing and economic development. So how did I come across that? Um, me and the chief of staff at that time, we got a call from a mother who and who um, stayed in this uh, house she was renting with her kids, and she was saying how it was mold. And at that time, she was paying some some decent amount of money, mm-hmm. and it bothered me that it even for me as a single person at that time, it was very hard for me to find a decent place to live. Um, either I made too much or not enough. Mm -hmm. Um, And I said, you know what? I want to create affordable housing. Let me go back and get my, because one, you know, it's a black woman, um, urban planning and development. There's very few of us and nobody take me seriously, unfortunately, unless I got these degrees behind my name. And I tell people all the time, they're like, why you got all these degrees? I said, I grew up at a time when you ain't had no paper behind your name, no letters behind your name. You weren't going to get in the room. That's period. You just weren't. And so I went back, got my master's in urban and regional planning from Michigan, and I did some housing development um, after that and fell into uh, economic development. um, And I ended up getting my MBA while I was falling into this economic development piece. Mm -hmm. What gave me a really strong footing in it was I was in a Detroit Revitalization Fellowship, Wayne State University, the first cohort. And I was working over at Vanguard. Um, and helped launch the small business incubator, was called the Milwaukee Junction Business Center, mm. um, based on national standards. So I started bringing in resources, uh, like with Eric uh, C. Williams, when he was at Wayne State's uh, Law, uh, he helped launch that um, program over there to meet with entrepreneurs, yeah, brought in SCORE. Always yeah, he always from day one when I first mm-hmm. saw him, I'm like, hey, we got this new business center. You want to come over here and do this? And he did and has been amazing since. Score, partner with Seed when Robin Kenny was over there doing mm-hmm. some amazing things. Uh, and started what we call the Detroit Entrepreneur Week, which was for community, place-based neighborhood businesses. Four days of coming together. Uh, April Boyle was a part of that. Davida Davison. Every mm-hmm. year we would do something that brought us together to celebrate neighborhood businesses. Um and we did that all the way until I left to Memphis. And so the fellowship was only two years. And I remember, like, I love I love this. This is helping me launch businesses. We did grant programs, did a variety of things. I was like, I want more of this. And so as the fellowship was coming to a close, it was like, what you want to do? What you want? I said, I still want to do economic development. I want to go and work with um, an organization that does business development, but that got a budget. It's the resources mm-hmm. so I could do more. Um, and from there, I went on to Tech Town and helped um, launch what we call the Retail Boot Camp in Swat City. Designed that program specifically as a way that would have uh, tangible benefits to businesses that they could see. Um, the worst thing for me, and I am an entrepreneur, I have been in programs where you come in and this high level stuff they tell you, and you like, mm, one, sometimes you're like, I already know that. And two, I ain't got the money for it. Mm, so, what do you do? So I was very intentional about, and I'm very good at designing programs, one, getting feedback from folks, knowing what the challenges were and saying, look, we want anybody who ever sit with us, talk to us to walk away with something that they can benefit from and they can see is a tangible result for them. And so with the retail boot camp and most of the folks who came in retail boot camp were ones from Bill, great programming there. You're going to walk away with your business that you're going to open between 6 to 12 months with the resource that we put in, with capital, with connections. Um, you're going to get there to be a turnkey. It was a lot of, it was high touch. 
hired a team of people who they're going to be with you in it along the way. And the majority of businesses that launched, you might as well say from 2000 and um, April and then launched 2012, 2013, you go forward, they started with Build and were a part of that retail boot camp, Tech Town program, Swat City um, on these corridors. And they've gone on to be able to go to Goldman Sachs. We would help a lot of businesses fill out information, do Motor City Match. And so it was important to me, not to just how you sitting in the class with this high level stuff, but business owners are, these small business owners are busy. They ain't got time to sit down with you and waste their time. So when we're working with them, then we would go into the businesses and go into the neighborhoods and meet them there. Um, you need to be able to say, yep, that time with you, that investment y'all did for me, it helped me yield this. I was able to get some equipment and now I got some sales. You know what I'm saying? And two, that's only part of it. Part of it is always, so when I would hire people and I hire people now, I'm like, are you able to have uh, for real direct conversations, you know, sort of like uh, tough love conversations with these business owners? <laughs> if you can't, then so, you ain't good for this. So, so many questions um, from what you gave and, and definitely a um, – a, a, a walk path with experience to, to be in this position that you're in. So uh, I'm definitely one that, that I agree. Cer certain rooms, the degree is respected um, just from the letters, but more so also, I, I believe, uh, even with my education, you're, you're speaking the language in in other forms. It's like you're, you're speaking the language, like a SWOT analysis or... Mm -hmm you know, debt to income ratio, you know, it, it, it body language, people can kind of tell like this person doesn't know. Can, <laughs> nowadays through, uh, through online resources, can you learn all this information just straight up YouTube university? Mm -hmm. Yes. The thing is, it's not going to be presented in the format of the academic standard. So it's like, it's kind of like, can you, could you learn you know, like if you're, it's like playing organized basketball <laughs> versus playing pickup basketball. Is there a person that's like straight up on a playground that is is running circles around mm -hmm. the average, even mm -hmm. NBA players? Yes, mm -hmm. there are. But the thing is, if we're playing in this organized world for the resources and access to the assets, then you got to kind of, you, you kind of got to know what a foul end. is, what's out of bounds. Right. You know how they're playing, and then it's like, okay, now I can take my creativity and put it in this format because that's really how I felt school was. Uh, so that it's not a bunch of people with their own methods of pickup basketball all walking in the room, and you don't know what what is, you know. And I like talking about, you know, one, I'm a lifelong learner, mm -hmm. I'm forever learning, I'm learning something as we're, we're talking now. Um, theory and practice, um, practice best practices is the best way that guides what I do theory for me sometimes is tricky that's the one thing in college I always used to be like okay this this person's theory who is it based on you know what I'm saying and I think a lot of things um that are um, contextualized during my education weren't necessarily inclusive right and so it's like I remember when I first started at Vista Maria they were like, read the file on the kid. Um, you know, the theory is this. I'll be like, I'm going to meet the kid first. Because your theory and the way you take theory, some people just apply it like, uh, you blink the way they said you would blink. You are applicable to this. I'm going to diagnose you as such. Mm. But the data and research that has happened hasn't been inclusive and brought certain groups in. So how do you know that theory? So I really lean into, I love best practices. And to your point, education does a thing where you can understand sort of the industry, the, the language, the what it mm -hmm. is, and be able to advocate for yourself if something is done that don't align with that. The other part is the practice is doing, speaking, and engaging so that if you've done it before, you can do it again. And so, yes. like, I've been, you know, I've done work in Detroit. I've mm -hmm. lived in Memphis and done work there. Back in Detroit, traveled around the country, talking to folks about the type of work and the way to do inclusive, econo inclusive uh, and diverse economic development from a lens, from a different lens, in ways that don't require you to um it requires you to always say to the team go go slow to go fast and, and furthermore it also it it 
provides the opportunity to buy yourself some time. Like mm-hmm. if we're speaking, it, it's just like, I don't know if anybody's ever been to a, a, a place where, you know, you don't speak the language there, but if you don't speak well, then it's just going to take a longer time to communicate. So mm-hmm. you can replicate something, you know, you can be in a, in a, in a leadership position and pass that task on to someone else and their understanding of like, okay, Hey, here go, here's my proposal. I did an introduction and I did my uh, conclusion, you know, you know, the flow of how else I write these Mm -hmm. proposals and I have my own style with Mm -hmm. it, but if it can be more understood now, someone else can even pick up the baton and run further with it. And it doesn't become so encompassed. And usually for most small business owners or just business owners in general. Well, I'm going to just say small because to scale up, you have to have systems that that you can let go and others could step in mm-hmm. and impose themselves and the machine keeps running. If 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 I'm a if I bake cakes and I'm the only like what April is it? Like if I'm the only person that knows how to make a chocolate cake and it's the best seller <laughs> you're not in my grow store. Fast. You ain't going to grow, you're not just going it'll be very difficult. Yes. Um Speaking of an example of, I remember when uh, me and a partner had a small batch manufacturing, and I love sewing, so I was one of the uh, three girls in the family who took to sewing from the time I was little. My mother would let me pin down the patterns, and when I got in high school, she said if I wanted to touch her singer, I had to take a class, and I did. Mm -hmm. And so this small-scale manufacturing... Wait, wait, time out. I got to say this. That's another one of those assets about some of them old schools that ain't open no more. But even some of them that still are open and they're just closed. Like Northwestern has a planetarium. Cooley has a whole. Cooley had like a whole, uh, uh w- like vocational school inside sure of did. Cooley. So sure like did. the at the stuff that students were learning from Cooley could be like you know go to the auto body shop, go to yep. salons, go to. My bad, I just wanted to oh, add no, that, I, but that, that's, that was that's those so were true. assets inside the school. And then I'm gonna tell y'all, even when it comes to type the type. Uh, writer, the I'm talking seriously, y'all. My mother never told me what I had to do uh, as far as classes. You, if I wanted to touch a singer, she was like, "You got to take swimming." But she made me take a typing class. I got to A in it. But y'all, well, I don't know how many people know about those big, heavy, heavy metal black ones. Your girl learned on that. Um, we had all the things necessary to go out and be successful, and also it was in that typing class too. Um, her name is Mrs. Wilmore. I um, always wanted to be a Delta. There were some women, who mm. one who was a librarian uh, and then one who was my typing teacher. Uh, and uh, it just so happened her daughter, Lisa Wilmore, who's also in uh, marketing, uh, she crossed Delta at my chapter. Okay. Um, my heart goes out to them there. Uh, her brother recently passed. Mm. But we had everything in Cooley High School, including, you know, just like you have at the Y, uh, Bowl Y at uh, track up the top. Track, we yeah. had that indoor track up top, and again, just amazing experience at Cooley. Um, and so I'm interested in you know what that building will be um, mm-hmm. for community, um, for alumni, because again, we've had picnics on there for like yeah. year after year after year, and everybody can come. You know, mm-hmm. we stay very engaged. I think uh, I'm gonna be a little biased here. I think the McKenzie picnic is a little bit. Uh, a little bit more kicking it, but I like I like Mackenzie though too because Mackenzie, cool. you know, Mackenzie has some good alumni, people. I ranked them with Mama Shoe last time. <laughs> I was gonna say Kettering. Yeah, if you my if you mama a, went to Kettering, you get an offer to go to the, the Kettering alumni picnic. Go, <laughs> go. My mama went Cooley, to you're gonna have some fun at the Cooley one. Mackenzie, yeah. go. You're gonna have some fun, but you know, yeah. you know, so. So, uh, like, it, it, in these systems, like, stepping into this role of you, you go to Memphis, come back to build. Uh, what, what drew you in? Mm-hmm. Um, how do you like this position in build? Uh, how, and uh, so let's just stop there, and then I have another question for you. After that. Um, I always, well, build is probably the only thing that could have brought me back aside from, you know, naturally if something was happening with family. I absolutely love Memphis. Memphis was uh, amazing, did some great work, built some really great relationships in Memphis. Um, I still have a business, uh, 901 Rock 
uh, Rock Development. Uh, we are real estate. We own some lots and property looking to do responsible development that will not price people out. That's why we consider ourselves a social enterprise. Uh, so great things. And um, uh, my boss who brought me to Memphis, she got a real big opportunity. So she was leaving. I'm like, hmm, I came here to work with her. And so I started, you know, talking to people, throwing my resume out there. Mm -hmm. And people were like, this job is open here. You should consider. And I paused for a moment. One, because as a professional, I know what I'm good at. I'm very good at early stage startup building things, getting them to the point where they can be scalable, repeatable, and all of that, right? The, yeah, uh, I'm, good at, I'm good at getting mm -hmm. it going and getting it where it can be repeatable, no hiccups, you know, mm -hmm. and managing it. After mm -hmm. When it's done, I'm like, uh, I know what I'm good and great at. And so I knew Build had been around for a while. Um, I actually was on the advisory board to help it become a nonprofit. Um, mm -hmm. We started that in 2017. Mm -hmm. And just before I left to Memphis, uh, January 2018, Build became its first known nonprofit. So I knew what Build had done and been engaged and had a crush on Build because it provided <laughs> the best education and support mm -hmm. to entrepreneurs. And Build's alumni is the strongest in our market, period, hands mm -hmm. down. You know, I've seen where some of our Build grads are opening uh, opening up a store and other Build grads come out and support them. It's an amazing, amazing thing to see and experience. Um and so I was asked a lot of questions. I was, you know, talking, he was talking about, I was interviewing the board members. I was just asking a lot, a lot of questions because I'm not really good at, you have to know yourself. To know yourself is a powerful thing, to know your strengths and your weaknesses. Um, I'm not good at implementing somebody else's stuff or helping, you know, move their stuff along. And because Build is a new nonprofit, they were like, you get to do a strategic plan, you get to hire your staff, just all the things to take Build forward as a nonprofit. I was like, and, you know, you talked and you negotiate, you know, the money, the money had to be, you know, right as well. And, you know, I want everybody to remember you ask for what you feel you deserve because uh, you're going to give 110 uh, percent. And I said, yes, hmm. came back um, November 2020. Um, and then the next thing you know, looked at data because mm -hmm. I, I don't just we're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're going to implement this. One, I like to co-design solutions with entrepreneurs in mind because that's who we're serving. And I saw that the majority of Bill grads were in what we call justified and proof of concept. And if you recall, Build started with helping ideators, you know. Um, and then, wait, and then November, we got we to gotta also acknowledge November 2020 is not the, it's a, strange time in business history in right America. definitely you know what definitely. I'm saying? So we were doing things in memphis supporting businesses in very unique ways i did a lot of capital solutions for you might as well say uh, main street businesses and launched a program the 800 initiative for helping black businesses grow with corporates um a university in the city uh, and Kresge gave us a do some donation for a capital program. So did a lot of stuff there to help build what we call Epicenter, which is basically like New Economy Initiative here. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was a, a very interesting time to come, which allowed me mm -hmm. to take the time to use some of the money. Coact, Coact, love Coact, because they do capacity building for organizations to do a strategic plan. Mm -hmm. Um, the plan for four, four years, I said, versus five and further, you know, COVID touch, you need to look be planning right now. And that's where I was going to say that that other reality of COVID-19, mm -hmm. you know, you know, a lot of businesses were like up in the air on everything. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Yeah. Looked at the data, saw where our entrepreneurs was, and I was like, OK, build supports ideators. And then in my experiences with Bill, they would hand them off to tech town and other places to help them take that business plan and grow launch you know and i'm like now we have people who are got customers um they stuck mm -hmm. they can't jump from um customers few customers you know consistent to growth so like scale. scaling up and scaling growing, growing and uh and basically bringing your you know it First off, all right, just starting a business, it takes courage. The That's idea. True. And then starting and getting out here. Then you sell a couple things. It's like, wow, this is good. And then you get to a point where it's like, all right, 
what moves do I want to make where this can grow at a pace where it's healthy for the business and healthy for me as the person Mm -hmm. owning the business. And help me with what I don't know at -hmm. this stage, right? So just like with every version of us, I'm like, you know, I got a birthday coming up next month. I've gone through some decades of living is a different version of me next time that requires different things. This position, this is the first time I've been a CEO of an organization. Have I been a managing director of a business unit? Have I managed teams? Yes, but to run an organization is a different thing and it requires a different version of me with different skills and knowledge. And so based on what we knew of where our alumni were and talking to them and looking at the data that NEI had, NEI Ralph Wilson Foundation did this really big survey across the ecosystem asking entrepreneurs what their need was. It aligned with what I was getting from entrepreneurs and what I thought, but I like to get data to say this is it. Not what Regina's gut right, is thinking based on what I'm seeing, but what we see. So based on that, we start raising funds to first capital to me is important because these uh, main street micro businesses sometimes need capital and sometimes you can't get it from a CDFI or you definitely can't go to a bank. Early stage tech has early stage capital in the pipeline. We know that, right? Mm -hmm. My whole thing is, and what we were doing in Memphis, we got to have early stage capital for these main street businesses to jump from proof of concept to bank bankable period Mm -hmm. and so talking with funders coming in and like can we do loan funds so we started two loan funds one specifically is for bill grads Hmm. um then we partnered also with ford to do a project where there's loans plus grants and i am continuing to raise money to not only put in those loan funds to have grants because what was happening i saw in my experiences um in the detroit market this is around the country our bill grads get to the certain point. They done talk to the subject matter experts. So we got a bill bench now with various subject matter experts. They can talk to them as much as they want about opportunities or working through pain points. We have different, we have bill basics. We still have it and build social impact. Now we put more classes at our cohort base and master classes to help these existing businesses where they are. You've done that, but you need money. So I'm constantly looking to raise money so that that's available. So what we've done over these past couple of years, and I'm in my third year as of November. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Time flies when you're busy and you're having fun. And I love what I do and I love entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. Um, we've built on April's legacy by, yes, we still support ideators. I love ideas. I got a bunch of ideas. But the majority of our resources are going to the majority of existing businesses that are bill grads who are existing, but also in all of our marketplaces. The majority are those micro businesses who have less than 10 employees, less than $250,000 annual revenue, even if they've been in business for 10 years. That's the majority of our marketplace. And so we want to help those people go from what we call justified. They got some customers. Mm -hmm. We want to help them jump to growth. Mm-hmm. And scale if that's what they so decide. And then, and then I think that that that's beautiful because also defining what that success is. And, and sometimes you may want to scale up for a project, mm-hmm. a program, uh, depending upon how you want to move. Um, and, and that's powerful that you're providing that asset um, for that. I think one of the toughest things, as I always say, in a lot of the business development community, when I interact with a lot of people, is sometimes the onboarding. Um, because it's like, okay, I'm writing this uh, business plan so I can get some money. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go through this program so I can get some money. I'm doing this so I can get some money. So, like, the focus is so focused on, like, Mm -hmm. whatever this figure may be, and that's uh, in design, whereas not necessarily seeing that those intrinsic values of each step of the way Mm -hmm. and adding that to appreciate what you're offering as a business owner is. Your connection to most customers um in in marketing like i tell people most of the tools i I say i i'm best with retention based tools and that's where like a a lot of business owners onboarding to seeing marketing first off a lot of people think marketing is advertising but let's put both in the same world Mm -hmm. um 
are always so focused on new customer and customer acquisition where it's like, you know, customer acquisition will cost you, you know, strategically maybe like threefold as much mm -hmm. as like what retention based tools are. And many of us aren't turning over those stones. So That's it's true. sometimes assets like that that you can give some game to and know where you want to be in the map of positioning and some of the projects and the programs because uh, having access to that opportunity when you're ready to move on it, that's what the beauty of these assets can mm -hmm. be. Like you want to have access to it when you're ready to move on it as that's opposed true. to being to the side, you know. So some of these acts that, you know, with the Detroit is different stuff. Like, yeah, some of this stuff takes more resources than other things and mixing both and having that balance, having that mm -hmm. understanding of uh, capacity because even when you get the money, Kind of comes the next layer of yep. things of did you really staunch out and, and stamp down your budget the way you needed to? Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're buying this, uh, like, for instance, you know, you can have a restaurant and you, you're you like, oh, we're going to be eco friendly and we buying this eco friendly, <laughs> this eco friendly uh, refrigerator and, and, um, and ventilation unit and, and, and oven. And the only people that repair it are all the way in Colorado. Right. So now you have this phenomenal piece of equipment that works optimum, mm -hmm. you know, the first three months. Now something breaks down and you got to be adding the, the, the flight expense <laughs> and some hotel expense for the person to fix this problem. So, like, sometimes having the full scope and understanding of what's going to happen, mm -hmm. that really matters. It does. And, and the. Uh, Especially like I know in buying my stage and just all my friends that are in business, you know, COVID did a number on the supply chain, mm -hmm. uh, depending upon what you were buying. So hence that, you know, time value cost of money. Another one of them economic concepts, uh, Walsh College. But basically it's like mm -hmm. money has different values when you get it. That's true. You know, when I wrote this business plan, I needed a million dollars. But because it's taking six more months, now I need two million. That's right. You know, and you need to have that written out because if you're coming to me and asking yep. for a million, I'm going to write a check for a million and I'm writing it for it to be successful. So you need to connect, connect, revisit, things. revisit your plan, revisit your budgets um, on a regular basis. You know, if what you projected or what you have there in your budget for this month, is it adequate? If not, if, if it is great, if not, what changes do you make? So, you know, oftentimes for us, and I'm like, remember I said, I'm a lifelong learner education. The one thing is several things I love about Bill. I said earlier, I had a crush on him. April was a genius in naming it Build Institute because I don't know if you know, she probably said the purpose behind the Institute were is like how you go to a college or a school or a, a, a trade school, vocational, and you get a skill where you can go out, you've learned, you've learned how to fish, you can either start your own business or work for somebody. So everything we do um is not about just here's a resource, but educating you so you're able to go out, make those decisions, go in your business, do what's necessary, come out of your business to evaluate and be strategic so that you are educated in those rooms. And so literally for us, we um, even brought what we call a capital education uh, master class. Mm -hmm. And it's hour and 30 minutes. And I tell people it ain't a capital readiness class. It ain't that. What it is, though, and what we discovered um, in our work is to help you understand the terminology, to help you understand the different types of capital in yourself and where you fit in each. So, one, you're not coming in a room where there is, uh, let's just say, a variety of different um, financial products and, and organizations, and you like, they said no to me, they said no to me. You're going to be educated enough to know, you know what, I'm not ready for um, the type of debt from a bank. I'm more so, you know, let me see what this CDFI has and what it understand, what it, you know, what mm -hmm. can work for me. Education is a powerful thing when you know what's what. So for everything that I do as a leader, I'm always like, what is the element? Are we teaching them? Even as a team, everything new from getting Microsoft to using Monday, I'm like, we want a training. You know, even uh, most people I'm familiar with um, Slack, mm -hmm. um, most people aren't. 
No, I, I mean, let's I'm get a, a training. Business things where it's like, yeah, you on Slack? Like, oh, here we go. Let's you know. get a training for everything because most places mm-hmm. I've worked, you're going to use this and this is what you're going to do. Yeah. And, you know, most people, one, the, the, the goal also of, of uh, you know, CEO and a leader is you want things to be efficient and effective for productivity to deliver what we're talking about. If you don't know how to use it, you're mm-hmm. intimidated by it. Then what? So we even train. Look, we're going to be so educated on all of this. That's why I'm like, we're thought leaders. We're a hub and we're thought leaders. Um, so educating folks to be able to use what they have, not only with the, when they're with us in the classroom or one on one, but when you're not in the room with Regina or with uh, Shanae or Ani or other people on our team, Heather, you're going to be able to do this on your own. You know what I'm saying? That's why they say education is powerful to open up a book and have knowledge. You can be very powerful. And this day you can go online, like we said earlier, and look at YouTube. It's a powerful thing when you know what you know and you've tested it out. You can walk in any room, command anything, and be successful. And that's for these business owners, but also people in their day-to-day. So Mm -hmm. Institute, Build Institute, we're about educating you. Um, while providing you the resources, I like to think a wraparound, sort of my my social work background, the wraparound to support you to be successful in your business. All right. So with that being said, and I'm going to have to bring you back. We get into the end. How do people get in contact with you or Build Institute itself? Well, so um, online is going to Build Institute, period, O-R-G. Uh, we also, one of the new services we have is co-working event and meeting space. We're at 1620 Michigan Avenue, Suite 120 on in Detroit on the Trumbull side. We're actually on the footprint of the Tiger Space, Tiger Stadium space. So we just finished final renovations and furniture and all the fixings on Thursday of this week. We just finished. We're going to have an open house coming up end of April. So now there will be a space for Bill Grass to come in, interact, and engage and do business, be in a safe space, um, and do some really cool things. Um, And then my email is regina at buildinstitute.org. And my value as a human being, as an economic development thought leader, is that when you come to build, just like anywhere else I was, you walk away with something of value, something you didn't know and something that you can use. That's key. All right. So now our classic Detroit is different questions. Very first car, year make and model, year you got it. <laughs> oh, God, I got a Topaz, a Mercury Topaz. It was mm. white, 1984. Mm. Okay. Um, bought it from um, uh, um, an elderly couple. Okay. And that had to be nineteen ninety four. Okay, so it has some it has some lived experience. <laughs> yes, on it. yes. Uh, where was the first place you went when you got it? Um, to my parents. Uh, okay. A lot of new things in life, and when things happen in the news, I go over and be like, "Hey, let me tell you something. Let me show you what I got." <laughs> it was like, uh, check this out. <laughs> okay, that's a good place to go. Um, you're the DJ at the end of the fireworks. You get to play three songs at Woodward and Jefferson. What three songs you playing? All I do is win. Okay. <laughs> All right. There um, we go. Oh, God. Oh, we. Uh, geez, oh, Pete, Curry. Oh, songs. What other songs would I play? Um, mm. God, I got so many. Okay, let me pause for a minute. Hmm. Atomic Atomic hype. Dog. Oh, you keeping the people hype. They're gonna be partying. Yes. We're yes. gonna be partying at Regina. Yes. DJ Regina. Yes. I love higher, music. Make it I love, for, as a DJ for real. I love music. I love, you know, dance. I ain't the best dancer nine days, but I love music and dance. Okay. And um It's gonna be a bunch of cues like just <laughs> through. And the del and the deltas too. <laughs> It'll it'll bring through. everybody out. It'll bring everybody out. <laughs> Um, 
Ain't nothing but a gangster party. It'll be you know, two pockets. Do, 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 do. So yeah, nothing, you you just party it. Nothing but a gangster you party. party. It you ain't party it all the way through. It. Like people, people know they turn it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, literally, you, you literally. Not playing no go home music. No, no standing on the wall, please. No, no standing on the wall. No, no Michael Jackson, lady no in stand, my life. No standing on the dance floor. <laughs> You coming with more? You coming with more hits now? <laughs> I actually just saw like a video with that. <laughs> you know, with the double Dutch bus, all types of people just dancing and stuff. The <laughs> Cupid show. <laughs> so, all right, last question. You can rename what word after one D trader. Who would it be and why? It would be um, Call Me Young. Okay, why? One of the most memorable. Mayors, um, for Detroit, mm-hmm. first black mayor, he had always been authentic, uh, even to the where you know he might cuss you out. And I remember this book is actually a book of the things he would say that Miriam Mahaffey had, and the we read it, it was just tick, it tickled. He did so much for Detroit, mm-hmm. um. He's an icon. Mm. He just is. And I admire him so much for his his work, his leadership, his legacy. Um, him being um, in a position where he did what was best for the city and the people. And he didn't just sort of go with money or or just compromise, uh, compromise himself. Um at the expense of Detroit. He just would say no to stuff. If it went good for us, he's like, mm, forget y'all. And you got to respect respect that. Um, to For him to be, again, the first black man to be the mayor and deal with all that he did and accomplish some great things for us. Um, I've always admired him. That's deep. That's deep. Thank you so much. Can't wait to get you back. It's going to be more of the synergy. We, we we building it. <laughs> Hence, no pun intended right there. So, thank you. <laughs> thank Big you. Big. Thank you. This was fun. <laughs> Black revolutionaries, distillery owners, Italian fashion retailers, and Motown Grammy winners all share their best stories never before told in any other media outlets on Detroit is Different. Visit DetroitIsDifferent.com or download the Detroit is Different app on Apple's App Store or Google's Play Store.